Section two of Aucassin and Nicolette, translated by Andrew Lang. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Section two. So speak they, say they, tell they the tale. Aucassin was armed and mounted, as ye have heard tell. God, how goodly sat the shield on his shoulder, the helm on his head, and the baldric on his left haunch. And the damoiseau was tall, fair, featly fashioned, and hardy of his hands. And the horse whereon he rode swift and keen, and straight had he spurred him forth of the gate. Now believe ye not that his mind was on kine, nor cattle of the booty, nor thought he how he might strike a knight, nor be stricken again, nor no such thing. Nay, no memory had Aucassin of aught of these. Rather he so dreamed of Nicolette, his sweet lady, that he dropped his reins, forgetting all there was to do, and his horse that had felt the spur bore him into the press and hurled among the foe, and they laid hands on him all about, and took him captive, and seized away his spear and shield, and straightway they led him off a prisoner, and were even now discoursing of what death he should die. And when Aucassin heard them, Ha! God! said he, sweet Saviour, be these my deadly enemies that have taken me, and will soon cut off my head? And once my head is off, no more shall I speak with Nicolette, my sweet lady, that I love so well. Natheless have I here a good sword, and sit a good horse unwearied. If now I keep not my head for her sake, God help her never, if she love me more. The damoiseau was tall and strong, and the horse whereon he sat was right eager, and he laid hand to sword, and fell a-smiting to right and left, and smote through helm and nasal, and arm and clenched hand, making a murder about him, like a wild boar when hounds fall on him in the forest, even till he struck down ten knights, and seven he hurt, and straightway he hurled out of the press, and rode back again at full speed, sword in hand. The Count Pougard of Alence heard say they were about hanging Aucassin, his enemy, so he came into that place, and Aucassin was ware of him, and gat his sword into his hand, and lashed at his helm with such a stroke that he drave it down on his head, and he being stunned fell groveling, and Aucassin laid hands on him, and caught him by the nasal of his helmet, and gave him to his father. Father, quoth Aucassin, lo, here is your mortal foe, who has so warred on you with all Malingen. Full twenty years did this war endure, and might not be ended by man. Fair son, said his father, thy feats of youth shouldst thou do, and not seek after folly. Father, saith Aucassin, sermon me no sermons, but fulfil my covenant. Ha! What covenant, fair son? What, father, hast thou forgotten it? By mine own head, whosoever forgets, will I not forget it, so much it hath me at heart. Didst thou not covenant with me, when I took up arms, and went into the store, that if God brought me back safe and sound, thou wouldst let me see Nicolette, my sweet lady, even so long that I might have of her two words, or three, and one kiss? So didst thou covenant, and my mind is that thou keep thy word. I, quoth the father, God forsake me when I keep this covenant. Nay, if she were here, I would let burn her in the fire, and thyself shouldst be sore adread. Is this thy last word? quoth Aucassin. So help me God, quoth his father, yea. Certes, quoth Aucassin, this is a sorry thing, meseems, when a man of thine age lies. Count of Valence, quoth Aucassin, I took thee. In sooth, sir, didst thou, saith the Count. Give me thy hand, saith Aucassin. Uh, sir, with good will. So he set his hand in the others. Now givest thou me thy word, saith Aucassin, that never whilst thou art living man 
wilt thou avail to do my father dishonour or harm him in body or in goods but do it thou wilt sir in god's name saith he mock me not but put me to my ransom ye cannot ask of me gold nor silver horses nor palfreys bear nor grease hawks nor hounds but i will give you them what quoth aucassin ha knowest thou not it was i that took thee yes sir quoth count Bougar. god help me never but i will make thy head fly from thy shoulders if thou makest not troth said aucassin in god's name said he i make what promise thou wilt so they did the oath and aucassin let mount him on a horse and took another and so led him back till he was all in safety here one singeth when the count garin doth know that his child would ne'er forego love of her that loved him so nicolette the bright of brow in a dungeon deep below child aucassin did he throw even there the child must dwell in a dun-walled marble cell there he waileth in his woe crying thus as ye shall know nicolette thou lily white my sweet lady bright of brow sweeter than the grape art thou sweeter than sack posset good in a cup of maple wood was it not but yesterday that a palmer came this way out of limousin came he and at ease he might not be for a passion him possessed that upon his bed he lay lay and tossed and knew not rest in his pain discomforted but thou camest by the bed where he tossed amid his pain holding high thy sweeping train and thy kirtle of ermine and thy smock of linen fine then these fair white limbs of thine did he look on and it fell that the palmer straight was well straight was hale and comforted and he rose up from his bed and went back to his own place sound and strong and full of face my sweet lady lily white sweet thy footfall sweet thine eyes and the mirth of thy replies sweet thy laughter sweet thy face sweet thy lips and sweet thy brow and the touch of thine embrace who but doth in thee delight i for love of thee am bound in this dungeon underground all for loving thee must lie here where loud on thee i cry here for loving thee must die for thee my love then say they speak they tell they the tale aucassin was cast into prison as ye have heard tell and nicolette of her part was in the chamber now it was summer-time the month of may when days are warm and long and clear and the nights still and serene nicolette lay one night on her bed and saw the moon shine clear through a window yea and heard the nightingale sing in the garden so she minded her of aucassin her lover whom she loved so well then fell she to thoughts of count garin de biaucaire that hated her to the death therefore deemed she that there she would no longer abide for that if she were told of and the count knew whereas she lay an ill death would he make her die now she knew that the old woman slept who held her company then she arose and clad her in a mantle of silk she had by her very goodly and took napkins and sheets of the bed and knotted one to the other and made therewith a cord as long as she might so knitted it to a pillar in the window and let herself slip down into the garden then caught up her raiment in both hands behind and before and kilted up her kirtle because of the dew that she saw lying deep on the grass and so went her way down through the garden her locks were yellow and curled her eyes blue and smiling her face featly fashioned the nose high and fairly set the lips more red than cherry or rose in time of summer her teeth white and small her breast so firm 
that they bore up the folds of her bodice as they had been two apples so slim she was in the waist that your two hands might have clipped her and the daisy flowers that break beneath her as she went tiptoe and that bent above her instep seemed black against her feet so white was the maiden she came to the postern gate and unbarred it and went out through the streets of beaucaire keeping always on the shadowy side for the moon was shining right clear and so wandered she till she came to the tower where her lover lay the tower was flanked with buttresses and she cowered under one of them wrapped in her mantle then thrust she her head through a crevice of the tower that was old and worn and so heard she aucassin wailing within and making dole and lament for the sweet lady he loved so well and when she had listened to him she began to say here one singeth nicolette the bright of brow on a pillar leanest thou all aucassin's wail dost hear for his love that is so dear then thou spakest shrill and clear gentle knight withouten fear little good befalleth thee little help of sigh or tear ne'er shalt thou have joy of me never shalt thou win me still am i held in evil will of thy father and thy kin therefore must i cross the sea and another land must win then she cut her curls of gold cast them in the dungeon hold aucassin doth clasp them there kiss the curls that were so fair them doth in his bosom bear then he wept even as of old all for his love then say they speak they tell they the tale when aucassin heard nicolette say that she would pass into a far country he was all in wrath fair sweet friend quoth he thou shalt not go for then wouldst thou be my death and the first man that saw thee and had the might withal would take thee straightway into his bed to be his limon and once thou camest into a man's bed and that bed not mine wit ye well that i would not tarry till i had found a knife to pierce my heart and slay myself nay verily wait so long i would not but would hurl myself on it so soon as i could find a wall or a black stone thereon would i dash my head so mightily that the eyes would start and my brain burst rather would i die even such a death than know thou had slain in a man's bed and that bed not mine o cassin she said i trow thou lovest me not as much as thou sayest but i love thee more than thou lovest me ah fair sweet friend said aucassin it may not be that thou shouldst love me even as i love thee woman may not love man as man loves woman for a woman's love lies in the glance of her eye and the bud of her breast and her foot's tiptoe but the love of man is in his heart planted whence it can never issue forth and pass away now while aucassin and nicolette held this parley together the town's guards came down a street with swords drawn beneath their cloaks for the count garin had charged them that if they could take her they should slay her but the sentinel that was on the tower saw them coming and heard them speaking of nicolette as they went and threatening to slay her god quoth he this were great pity to slay so fair a maid right great charity it were if i could say aught to her and they perceive it not and she should be on her guard against them for if they slay her then were aucassin my damoiseau dead and that were great pity here one singeth valiant was the sentinel courteous kind and practised well so a song did sing and tell of the peril that befell maiden fair that lingerest here gentle maid of merry cheer 
hair of gold, and eyes as clear as the water in a mere. Thou, meseems, hast spoken word to thy lover and thy lord, that would die for thee, his dear. Now beware the ill accord of the cloaked men of the sword. These have sworn, and keep their word, they will put thee to the sword, save thou take heed. Then speak they, say they, tell they the tale. Ha! quoth Nicolette, be the soul of thy father and the soul of thy mother in the rest of paradise, so fairly and so courteously hast thou spoken me. Please God, I will be right ware of them. God keep me out of their hands. So she shrank under her mantle into the shadow of the pillar till they had passed by and then took she farewell of Aucassin, and so fared till she came unto the castle wall. Now that wall was wasted and broken, and some deal mended, so she clomb thereon till she came between wall and fosse, and so looked down, and saw that the fosse was deep and steep, whereat she was sore adread. Ah, God, saith she, sweet Saviour, if I let myself fall hence, I shall break my neck, and if I here abide, to-morrow they will take me and burn me in a fire. Yet liefer would I perish here than that to-morrow the folk should stare on me for a gazing-stock. Then she crossed herself, and so let herself slip into the fosse, and when she had come to the bottom, her fair feet and fair hands, that had not custom thereof, were bruised and frayed, and the blood springing from a dozen places. Yet felt she no pain nor hurt, by reason of the great dread wherein she went. But if she were encumbered to win there, in worse was she to win out. But she deemed that there to abide was of none avail, and she found a pike sharpened, that they of the city had thrown out to keep the hold. Therewith made she one stepping-place after another, till with much travail she climbed the wall. Now the forest lay within two crossbow-shots, and the forest was of thirty leagues this way and that. Therein also were wild beasts, and beasts serpentine, and she feared that if she entered there they would slay her but anon she deemed that if men found her there, they would hale her back into the town to burn her. Here one singeth. Nicolette the fair of face climbed upon the coping-stone, there made she lament and moan, calling on our Lord alone for his mercy and his grace. Father, King of Majesty, listen, for I nothing know where to flee or whither go. If within the wood I fare, lo, the wolves will slay me there, boars and lions terrible, many in the wild wood dwell. But if I abide the day, surely worse will come of it, surely will the fire be lit that shall burn my body away. Jesus, Lord of majesty, better seemeth it to me that within the wood I fare though the wolves devour me there, than within the town to go. Ne'er be it so. End of section 2 of Aucassin and Nicolette Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio